It's always a pleasure to welcome David McCullough and his wife, Rosalie, who's here tonight, wonderful, uh, to the MHS. This is a place where we spent many days, many of them in this very room, which is our reading room uh, by day. And of course, unless you've been on a desert island or an outer space, he requires no introduction. But maybe I'll give you a, a bit of a refresher. David McCullough has been widely acclaimed as a master of the art of narrative history. He is twice winner of the Pulitzer Prize, twice winner of the National Book Award, and has received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award. He is also the most recent recipient of our highest award, the Kennedy Medal. His most recent book, the widely praised The Wright Brothers, the focus of tonight's presentation, has been number one on the New York Times bestseller list. The Greater Journey, American in pa Americans in Paris, also number one bestseller, has been called Dazzling, History to be Savored. His 1776 has been acclaimed a classic, while John Adams, published in 2001, remains one of the most praised and widely read American biographies of all time, and of course, our favorite. His other books include The Johnstown Flood, The Great Bridge, The Path Between the Seas, Mornings on Horseback, Brave Companions, and Truman. His books have been published in 17 languages, and none have ever been out of print. He's not only an author, David has been an editor, a teacher, a lecturer, and familiar presence on public television. You may remember him as host of Smithsonian World and the American Experience, and narrator of numerous documentaries, including Ken Burns' The Civil War. He is also, th his is also the narrator's voice in the movie Seabiscuit. John Adams, the seven-part miniseries on HBO based on his book and produced by Tom Hanks, was one of the most acclaimed uh, television events of recent years. He is also one of the few private citizens to speak before a joint session of Congress. In the words of the citation accompanying his honorary degree from Yale, as an historian, he paints with words, giving us pictures of the American people that live, breathe, and above all, confront the fundamental issues of courage, achievement, and moral character. Please join with me in welcoming a great friend of the Massachusetts Historical Society, David McCullough. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you all very much. It is a joy to be back here and to see so many old friends and familiar surroundings. I've had some of the happiest days of my working life right here in this very room, and particularly the years I spent doing the research for my book on John Adams. I, um, I also appreciate that you mentioned um, my work for public television. I had a, um, an incident take place this past winter um, right here in the neighborhood at uh, the uh, Star Market here in Back Bay that I want to uh, tell you about. Um, as you remember, there were the interludes between the blizzards of two or three days. <laughs> and in order to find provisions by which to survive, you had to get out to a supermarket or market somewhere. And Rosalie and I did this several times, and one of the times, we made up a list of all that we needed, and I decided I would be the hero and venture forth myself over to Star Market uh, from our apartment, and I got there and found that it was absolute mob scene because everybody was trying to seek um, provisions to sustain life, and I went about finding the items that we'd put on the list, and I found everything except the cashew nuts. <laughs> and as you all well know, cashews are essential to survival. And, <laughs> and there was a fellow walking by with a Star Market label on his shirt, and I said, excuse me, could you tell me, please, where the cashew nuts are? He said, yes, follow me. So I followed him, and we went around a couple of turns, and he pointed it out, and I thanked him very much and he went on his way. And about 10 minutes later, I was checking out at the cash register, and he came up to me and he said, 
that voice, your voice, said, have I heard that on television? I said, yes, there's probably a good chance you have. He said, were you the narrator of the Ken Burns series on the Civil War? I said, yes, I was. He said, well, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. When that series first came on the air, I was suffering terribly from insomnia. <laughs> I'd hear your voice and go right out. <laughs> so I, I, hope that, I hope it doesn't have that effect on any of you tonight. I think the two most le important lessons, the mo two most important subjects that one can draw from history are ideas and character. Character matters above all. And it comes through or it doesn't come through. And if the evidence is there, that's all the more reason to make the most of it. And if there were, what can be said, if there was one expression or one summing up about the Wright brothers that to me is most powerful of all is they are, were men of great character. Not just courage, but character. The character of their convictions, character that they were brought up on, uh, brought up to adhere to in their home environment. Now we also are living in a time, unfortunately, where the humanities, the liberal arts, are in decline and encouraged very often by well-meaning parents and well-meaning professors and well-meaning university administrators who feel that the uh, oncoming generations must concentrate on the technology and science and the internet and the computer and all of that because that's the world we live in and therefore that's what they should specialize in and when they graduate, they will have higher incomes, and therefore they'll be able to pay off their university debts, or their parents will have a, a chance to help pay them off because these young people are making good livings. All understandable, and all a mistake. And one of the points I want to make tonight to you is it's worth thinking about that these two brothers, these two amazing Americans, who broke, who s solved the most difficult technical problem, the most commonly believed to have been impossible problem, had no scientific or technical training whatever. They were steeped in and raised on and educated in the liberal arts, period. They never finished high school, let alone never went to college. But they grew up in an atmosphere where curiosity was stimulated from the time they were old enough to talk. They lived in a little house in Dayton, Ohio, which is now at the Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. A little house with no running water, no indoor plumbing, no electricity, no telephone, but full of books. And the books that were there were selected for them by themselves, to be sure, but mainly by their father, Bishop Milton Wright, who was an itinerant minister and who believed fervently that they must learn to use the English language, not just correctly, but effectively, and that they must read and read all the time and read above their level. So in that little house, along with a few very spare furnishings, were the works of Virgil, and Plutarch's Lives, and Thucydides, and the Bible, and Mark Twain, and Hawthorne, and Sir Walter Scott, and orth ornithology, and natural history, and history, French history, American history, theology, you name it, it was all there. And they were within walking distance of the public library where their father went regularly, almost every day, and they grew up knowing that's where you go if you want books, and you want to know more about any one given subject. They, the two brothers, Wilbur and Orville, <coughs> and their sister Catherine, the younger sister, read all the time, as did their father, as did their mother, who at last died when they were still teenagers. 
and who was very bright, as was their father. Their letters have survived. Not just the brother's letters, but Catherine's letters, and the father's letters, and some of the mother's letters. And they're all, thank goodness, in a great collection, in an imme in imme immeasurably important collection at the Library of Congress. There are over a thousand letters, just private correspondence, family correspondence in that collection. And none of those members of the family was capable of writing a short letter or a boring letter. <laughs> thank goodness. And when you read the quality of their language, the use of the English language, it's humbling. The vocabulary, again, two young men who never finished high school because they were too interested in other ideas and other things. They didn't have time for that. When their sister Catherine's birthday came up, they, boy, the brothers teamed up and used what money they had to buy her a bust of Sir Walter, Sir Walter Scott as her birthday present. Imagine, now this again, I stress, most people from the 10 minutes the subject was given in high school, most of us, we know there were bicycle mechanics from somewhere in Ohio and they invented the airplane. All true. But there's ever so much more to it when you find out what they were like as people. They were raised to be honest. They were raised to work hard. They were raised to be good neighbors. They were raised to do their best at whatever they did. They were raised to have purpose in life, high purpose, a mission, as the father did as an itinerant minister, but they were to choose their own purpose. And they were raised to be modest. Remember modesty? Remember when that was thought to be a virtue among public people and running for office? Um, they never changed, they became the most two famous two people in the world and were amply rewarded financially, not along just the limelight, and they never changed whatsoever. Now some of that is a traditional Midwestern upraising, upbringing. Harry Truman once said, I tried never to forget who I was and where I came from and where I'd go back to, which is exactly what he did. It's exactly what the Wright brothers did after they achieved what they set out to do. Now, I find great gratification, satisfaction, excitement in trying to give people credit where credit is long overdue. I felt that way with Harry Truman. I felt that way with John Adams. I felt that way with the Roeblings who built the Brooklyn Bridge. And I certainly felt it, in this case, with the father and, more conspicuously, the sister Catherine. She's always been sort of left in the wings, or if, if on stage, barely on stage. She belongs downstage. She belongs in the floodlights. Because if she hadn't been there, I don't think the story would have come out the way it did. She was extraordinary. And writing about her was for me a joy from the start to finish. Because she was a character. She was feisty, wrathy as she could say, and she was funny. And she watched them like a hawk, particularly after their mother's death. She became the woman of the house. And she was always there when they needed her. And she made them live up to standards when they seemed to be falling back where beyond where she thought they should be. She's the only one who went to college. She went to Oberlin, and she majored in Greek and Latin. She was a top student, came home to teach Greek and Latin at the local high school in Dayton. And as Orville liked to say, when, as a teacher, she flunked many of the future leaders of the city of Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel the same way about the father. If I could have interviewed any one of these four in real life, if there were some magical way that I could interview, the father would be the one that I would interview. Because he saw it all happen. And he had total confidence in them. And he was willing to, to back everything they did, even though he really didn't understand the technology and the physics and the rest that they were talking about. Now, yes, they invented the airplane, but they also invented flight, flying the airplane. This is a very important point that most people don't understand. 
they, they developed a machine that would fly, but they had to know how, learn how to fly it. So they were the first ever test pilots. And please keep in mind that every time they went up on a test flight, they were risking their lives. They could be killed. And they were very conscious of this. They weren't daredevils. They weren't show-off stuntsmen. They wanted to make sure that they got it right so that when they went up, nothing would go wrong and they would get killed. And they refused ever to go up together when they developed a plane that would carry two passengers. Because if one got, if only one of them got killed, then the other would be still be there to carry on with the mission. They never married. They never went on vacations. They never... Uh, got interested in material possessions. All they wanted to do was accomplish this purpose. And they were confident that if they didn't get killed, they could do it. They also had no money behind them, no foundation, no university, no Smithsonian Institution, uh, no Andrew Carnegie picking up all the bills. All that they expended for their work they paid for out of what were rather m modest earnings in their bicycle shop. They built bicycles. They built magnificent bicycles, beautiful bi bicycles. And they did all that work that they on, the, on their air aviation experimental developments at night or on, on weekends, after hours. So they were customarily working not eight hours a day, 12 hours a day. Eight hours in the shop, another four hours or sometimes more on working on their gliders or their airplanes that they were building in the shop themselves. And everybody in town thought they were wacko. It was common knowledge they were awfully nice fellows, very polite, very gentlemanly, but weird. And even after they flew at Kitty Hawk, the memorable historic day, December 17, 1903, the world did not believe that man could fly. Strange as it may seem, we naturally think, oh, that was 1903, Wright Brothers flew, everybody knew the airplane had arrived. No, didn't happen that way, because everybody knew man can't fly. The United States government took no interest in what they were doing whatsoever. When they had op volunteered to bring their plane to Washington to show them what they could do, they had the door slammed in their face again and again. The newspapers right in Dayton had no interest in what they were doing. They wouldn't even send a reporter out to watch them flying, often, right eight miles out of town. And when one of the managing editors was asked years later, how in the world could this be? It was happening right under your noses. What, what was the matter? He said, I guess we were just plain stupid. And it wasn't until a French delegation showed up in Dayton in late in 1905, having heard, having gotten the word that this was happening and these brothers had done it, that they said, you come on over to France and show us, demonstrate what you can do. And that's what happened. They didn't like to do that, the, the Wright brothers, because they were profound patriots, but they just were sick of having, being snubbed and, and ignored. So Wilbur went to France in 1908, and on the <laughs> eighth day, of August 1908, the eighth day of the eighth month of the eighth year of the new century, Wilbur Wright flew at Le Mans, the great racetrack town south east of Paris, for about uh, in front of an audience of, in the little racetrack uh, bleachers there, about, about 100 people. Within days, thousands were coming to watch the miracle, coming from all over France and coming from all over Europe. And that's when the world knew man had achieved flight. Now before that happened, there were two very important Americans who were trying to achieve flight. The first was Octave Chanute, who was one of the most important bridge engineers of the day. Brilliant bridge engineer, French born, but an American citizen who built the great first bridge over the Missouri River at Kansas City still there. The other was Samuel Langley, who was an astronomer, who became the secretary of the Smithsonian, who developed what he called his aerodrome. And it looked like a giant insect. And it was to be launched from the 
the roof of a huge houseboat just downstream from Washington on the Potomac River. Neither Langley, neither Chanute, who worked on gliders, or Langley, who was working on a, on a powered uh, air machine, ever went up in their, in their inventions. Oh, no. They left that to some other young fellow who was willing to risk his life. So neither of them ever learned to glide or to fly. Furthermore, Langley was using public money to develop his invention, his aerodrome. And while it doesn't seem like very much to us, it was a fortune then in public money, Smithsonian Institution money, Smithsonian Institution uh, staff working for him. It wasn't even counted in what the cost was. Of $50,000 and another 25000 or so was contributed by a number of his wealthy friends. So well over $70,000. The total, and Langley's plane was launched about two weeks before the Wright plane at Kitty Hawk in 1903. In the winter, very cold, the Potomac was full of, of uh, sheets of ice, and the plane shot up into the air, launched off the top of the houseboat, shot up into the air about 60 feet, fell over backwards slightly, and then turned on a nosedive right into the water only 25 feet or so from where it took off. Total fiasco, total failure, and which crushed Mr. Langley in spirit, and he never recovered from it, and it became the laughing stock, and talk, taken to be absolute proof that man cannot fly. When Wilbur was asked uh, about this uh, approach that he and his brother had taken, he gave a wonderful analogy. He said there are two ways to train a wild horse. One is to sit on a fence with a notepad and watch the horse, and if you've collected enough uh, notes on your pad, retire to a comfortable chair and a good lamp and write a thesis on how to train a wild horse. The other is to get on the horse and ride it, which is exactly what the Wright brothers did. They not only invented the machine, they mastered the art of flight. Now, how did they do that? They did it by watching soaring birds. And it all goes back to what they were reading at home in that little house in the back streets of Dayton, Ohio, and the importance of reading, of research, of the inspiration that comes from books. And the book that had the most influence on them, by far, was a book written by a French theorist um, who was also an extraordinary writer, very poetic. And Wilbur, who was the older of the two brothers, Wilbur, it should be clear, Wilbur was a genius, no question about it. Uh, Orville, the younger brother, was very clever, ingenious, um, uh, mechanically, but he didn't have the reach of mind that Wilbur had. And this book, which was called The Empire of the Air, which had been translated into English, was published in Paris in 1881. Nothing Wilbur had ever read so affected him. He would long consider it, quote, one of the most remarkable pieces of aeronautical literature ever published. And the operative word there was literature. For Wilbur, flight had become a cause. And Mouillard, the author, Pierre Mouillard, and Mouillard, one of the greatest missionaries of the cause, like a prophet crying on in the wilderness, exhorting the world to repent of its unbelief in the possibility of human flight, unquote. At the start of the Empire of the Air, Millard gave fair warning that one could be entirely overtaken by the thought that the problem of flight could be solved by man. When once this idea has invaded the brain, it possesses it exclusively, exactly what happened to the Wright brothers. Oh, blind humanity, Millard wrote. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt see millions of birds and myriads of insects cleaving the atmosphere, 
All these creatures are whirling through the air without the slightest support. Many of them are gliding therein without losing height, hour after hour, on pulseless wings without fatigue. And after beholding this demonstration given by the source of all knowledge, thou wilt acknowledge that aviation is the path to be followed. He was writing about one of his favorite soaring birds, a vulture that he liked to observe in North Africa, Muard was. And he said, to wrote of him, he knows how to rise, how to float, how to sail upon the wind without effort. He sails and spends no force. He uses the wind instead of his muscles. Now, from that and from their own observations of soaring birds, particularly at Kitty Hawk, once they got there, and particularly the giant gannets, which have wingspans of five to six feet, who can stay up there, just as Muyard writes, for hours without flapping their wings, just by riding the wind. It became apparent to Wilbur and to Orville that the wind was the answer, the ways of the winds. Now, I have a lot of Irish ancestry, and I love the old Irish saying, may the wind always be at your back. But that's exactly what they saw not to be the process or the route to the success in this endeavor and in life. And one of the most powerful of all the observations written in Wilbur Wright's notebooks on his ob observations on bird, soaring birds, it, it, which he wrote at Kitty Hawk, which is part of that great same great collection at the Library of Congress, he writes, no bird ever soared in a calm. If you want to get up there, you can't do it in a calm. You have to have the wind, which is why they went to Kitty Hawk, because they needed the wind, and also they loved the idea of all that soft sand, of the sand dunes you know, on which to land, and the fact that there were very few people living there, and they wouldn't be bothered much by sp the curious and the question questioning of, of constant kibitzers. When the people who lived on Kitty Hawk, and there were relatively few, as I say, uh, mostly fishermen and their families, saw these two brothers who arrived there in wearing their business suits that we would wear on the streets of, of Dayton and hats and starch white collars and neckties out on the beach imitating the soaring birds and twisting their hands and wrists the way the birds twist at the end of their wings they thought these two are absolutely crackpots. And, and it only was when they saw how hard they could work that they began to think they're all right. As one of them said, they're the workingest boys we ever saw. And to work to survive on that, uh, the outer banks of North Carolina. They could remember, no, no bridges, no roads. To survive, uh, it was a meagerest kind of living. It took all the work that anybody could give all through, all through their lives from childhood on. The first written account of, the, of real flight achieved back at the uh, Huffman Prairie cow pasture in Dayton in 1905 was written by a man who kept, uh, who, who produced beekeeping equipment in Ohio. A little fellow, about five foot four, uh, who, who's uh, Amos Roots, who had made a fortune with his beekeeping and who was interested in everything. And he got wind of the, what the Wright brothers were up to, and he went down to watch and see for himself with their permission. He asked, wrote ahead and asked, if, could he come? And he wrote this marvelous piece, which he then published in his beekeeper's journal. And it was not only long and detailed, but totally accurate. And it was the first published account of this miracle ever to appear in a beekeeper's journal. The New York Times, the Scientific American, Chicago Tribune, you name it, none of them bothered to even come and watch. When Amos Root offered this piece that he'd written to Scientific American for free to publish, they didn't even bother to answer his letter. So blind were they all to what had been done. And what a miracle that was done by these two men. And how narrow viewed of us 
to take no interest in this, it changed the world in a matter of no time. We get on airplanes today, we fly through 35, 40,000 feet at 600 miles an hour or not, and think nothing of it. How did it happen? Who were those guys? How'd they do it? Now, I have never not found something that had not been previously discovered in any of the books that I've undertaken. So it's not as if it's all ground that has been worked over and, and there's no use to do it because you won't find anything new. Well, that's not true, you do. And this book was no exception. And what I found was very exciting to find, to say the least. And I think very revealing of something important that we have to keep in mind about imagining other times and the true human nature of history. When he was about 18 years old, Wilbur was hit in the teeth with a hockey stick in a pickup game with some of his neighborhood friends on a frozen pond in, in the area. And it knocked out all of his upper teeth. Now this was a time when dentistry was pathetic, primitive, when anesthetics were virtually unknown. The pain was excruciating and it took a long time just to recover. But it was also humiliating for him in the extreme. He was a handsome young man and he was popular and he was a good athlete and suddenly he's this disfigured boy um, whose face was hard to look at given what had happened to it. And he retreated into a self-imposed isolation at home. He was going to go to Yale University. His father thought that was a fine idea and he was ambitious to pursue an academic career. Instead, he stayed at home in the house looking after much of the time his mother who was dying of, type of uh, tuberculosis. And it was then that he began to read for three years in this self-imposed isolation. And it caused a terrific swerve in his whole life direction. The talk of Yale ended. He was off on this pursuit of knowledge, writing to the Smithsonian, asking for information, all of that. And as a consequence, it led him down a path that led to the invention of the airplane. Most, this beneficial change that could have happened, but it was adverse, no bird soars in a calm. He had a headwind the likes of which nobody ever imagined, nobody in the family. Well, in Bishop Wright's diary, there is an entry that followed Wilbur's death in 1912. He died when he was still in his 40s. Tragically, he died of typhoid fever. His father had warned about the perils of impure water all their lives. It was like a Greek tragedy. They'd been warned and warned and warned, and that's what killed him. But the question was, who hit him in the teeth with the hockey stick, and was it intentional or not? Well, in the bishop's diary in 1913, he writes to explain who the boy was that hit him and what happened to him. His name was Oliver Hay, H-A-U-G-H. And Oliver Hay lived right around the corner in the same neighborhood. And he became the most notorious murderer in the history of Ohio. He killed his father, his mother, his brother, and an estimated 12 others or more. Now, isn't it fascinating that one of the ultimate geniuses of our story as a people grew up in the same neighborhood with the ultimate expression of evil in a human being. Now, there's a tendency when you look at the pictures of residential Dayton and the house the, right, the Wrights lived in, the living room and the dining room and all that, that it was kind of a Norman Rockwell scene. And it was to a degree but not entirely, by any means. Now, whether Hay was uh, executed in 1906, whether he hit Wilbur intentionally or not, 
we still don't know. But that doesn't mean we might someday find out. What's curious is there's no mention of this turning point in anything that the brothers wrote that has survived or anything that his sister wrote, only this one diary entry put in there by the father. But what a, what a thrill to find something like that. Now I have to stress that my work has never been done alone. I made that point at the very beginning. And one of the great blessings of my working life has been the help of a marvelous man named Mike Hill, who has spent hours and hours and cumulatively months here in this wonderful repository, uh, working with Peter Drummy and others, and who treasured that experience as much as I have. Mike lives outside of Washington, D.C., and so he's able to work with the Smithsonian's collections and the Library of Congress and the National Archives and other libraries and collections in the area. And he works from a number of other well-known writers and historians and biographers whose work you well know. <coughs> and I think he's the best in the business. And um, it's been a, a tremendous blessing and also one of the, the uh, rewards of my working life to have, have such a friend. And he's gone with me on all of these treks around the, the country and around Europe. We've been not only to Kitty Hawk many times, we've been to Dayton, we've been to the Dearborn Museum, uh, we've been to Paris, we've been to Le Mans, we've been to Poe, where Wilbur went on to demonstrate further uh, ex uh, demonstrations of his, of his uh, brilliant achievement in warmer weather down by the Spanish border. And you have to do that. You have to go there. You have to talk to people there. And everywhere we go, there's someone who has something to tell us. And everywhere we go, we have the reward of meeting wonderful people, people who will give up their time, whole days, in order to help, at no charge, at no fee. It's exciting, because people do care. Lots of people care, and not just other historians or scholars or archivists. I um, I see, keep coming back to um, to the brothers themselves and what they wrote, and to Catherine and what she wrote. One of the most horrific experiences of all was when Wilbur, excuse me, when Orville had a crash when he finally was invited to demonstrate what they had developed at Fort Myer across the Potomac River from Washington, and thousands came over from the government, from the White House from the cabinet, <coughs> from the Congress to watch this miracle. And Orville went up and was breaking all kinds of world records almost by the day, at the same time that Wilbur was over at Le Mans demonstrating there in front of, it was like a two ring circus uh, with a, one brother in each location. And, um, and then one day, Orville took a young lieutenant, Thomas Selfridge, an army lieutenant, up with him as a passenger, he'd been taking many others, and something went wrong with the plane, and it crashed 75 feet straight down into the ground. And young Selfridge was killed, the first fatality in aviation history. And Orville was very nearly killed, had many bones broken, and he was badly scarred and, and bruised. And again, his, his confidence was shaken. He was horrified by the death of Selfridge. And when Catherine back in Dayton got word that this has happened, on an afternoon after, she, after she'd returned from teaching at the high school, she called the principal of the school and said she was taking an indefinite leave of absence. She was packed and on a train bound for Washington before the day was over. She then spent the next six, five and a half, six weeks with Orville at the base hospital at Fort Myer making sure he got the best care possible and making sure that, that she could do, did everything she could to keep his spirits up. It was thought that he would never walk again and he would certainly never fly again. And he, she saw him through it and he later said himself and others did too, if it weren't for her, he probably wouldn't have made it. And he, she got him back to Dayton 
and kept working with him, kept encouraging, and he not only walked again, but he flew again. And at his insistence, much against the advice of Wil both Wilbur and Catherine and the father, that he shouldn't go back to, to Fort Myer. It was too traumatic for him, too many memories, too many fe feelings of regret or guilt over the death of young Selfridge. But he insisted he had to go back where it happened. And he went back, and he flew again, and he continued to break more records. It's one of the most remarkable comebacks I've ever known in what I've written about. And one of the lessons that you get from this story is they would not give up. And they always learned from their mistakes. They always learned from their failures. Whether it was a technical failure with an aluminum motor block that they pioneered, split, uh, when it was first tested, they built another one and it worked, or whether it was finding that all the details, the data, the tables of, of technical mathematics used by people like Chanute and, uh, and Langley were wrong. They were worthless, as Orville said. Uh, they then said, well, we'll have to do that ourselves. So they created their own wind tunnel. They created little models of wing uh, shapes out of hacksaw blades, and they created their own tables, which were correct. All way ahead of anybody at MIT or Rensselaer or the Smithsonian Institution, all on their own by learning from their mistakes. Their point was that you, if you're knocked down, you don't lie there and whimper and whine and lapse into self-pity. You get back up on your feet, figure out what you did wrong, do it right, and go at it again. And what a lesson for young people to learn today. And what a lesson to learn about use of the English language. Almost half of all the business schools in our country today require incoming freshmen who are all college graduates to take a basic writing course because they are incapable of writing a presentable letter or report or proposal. Pathetic. And here they are, these two examples of the boys, that young men that never even finished high school because of the way they were brought up. Orville was, uh, Wilbur rather, was asked once, uh, if you had to give advice to uh, somebody, young people today, uh, about how to succeed, what would you say? He said, I would tell them to pick out a good mother and father and grow up in Ohio. Now, I want to read you something that the father, that in closing, I want to read something to you that the father wrote about Wilbur. After Wilbur's premature death, tragic death, in 1912. He died in his bedroom at home at 7 Hawthorne Street, the house in Dayton, at 3.15 in the afternoon, in the morning, of Thursday, May 30th, 1912. He was 45. A short life full of consequences, the bishop wrote. An unfailing intellect, imperturbable temper, great self-reliance, and as great modesty. Seeing the right clearly, pursuing it steadily, he lived and died. Oh, that that could be said of more of us today. That's my talk.